I would say the most dangerous issue, absolutely, is the transgenderism. Transgenderism is robbing young people of their identity in terms of Genesis 127, that God created you in his image, male and female. They have no hope whatsoever. The suicide rate among transgender young people right now is just absolutely horrific. Hey, and welcome to Zero Compromise, helping you stand for truth in the world that falls for lies. I'm Rob Webb, aka Rocket Rob is what they call me. I'm here with Jessica DeFord, aka JJ. Hello, and what's up, guys? Yes. So we are sadly without Patricia Angler today, but what's going on today, JJ? We are honored to talk with Daryl Harrison. We're really looking forward to the conversation. And make sure you guys stay tuned for this whole episode. Thanks guys, first of all, for having me here. It's a really honor to be here at the ARC encounter with all of you. Uh, so yes, I'm Daryl Harrison, lead host of the Just Thinking Podcast. And just to give some background for those of you who may not be familiar with the Just Thinking Podcast, the podcast originated in December of 20, 2017. I co-hosted with my brother in crime, Virgil Walker. <laughs> Virgil Walker is the director of operations for G3 Ministries based in Atlanta, suburban Atlanta. Six years we've been doing the podcast together. The podcast is a long form expositional podcast. So it is unique in that regard as far as podcasts go. Many of our episodes are two, two and a half, three, three and a half hours long, which is why I emphasize the description as an expository podcast. We really dig deep into the topics and, and try to give listeners a thorough understanding of the topic through the lens of a biblical worldview. Um, we've got 124 episodes recorded to date. Uh, over the six years that the podcast has been in existence, we've accumulated more than 6 million downloads. So the podcast has a global footprint. And I, I again, would really encourage uh, your listeners who aren't familiar with it to just go to justthinking.me. That's justthinking.me, or you can subscribe to Just Thinking wherever you listen to your podcast. It is a fantastic podcast. I really do encourage uh, listeners to go and take a listen to it because it has personally helped me in a lot of ways. And so I'm very thankful for it personally. Um, you didn't always start as a podcaster or in ministry. So can you share your testimony and um, how the Lord brought you into ministry? Yeah. So um, I'm originally from Atlanta, Georgia, and I was raised uh, by my mom and dad. I had an older brother and a younger sister uh, in one of the more economically impoverished areas of the city. I grew up on the west side of Atlanta near the Atlanta University Center, where some of your listeners may be familiar with some of the colleges over there. There was Spelman College, which is um, a college for uh, black, I'm sorry, female students. Then there's Morehouse College uh, in that same area, uh, Clark College, and then there's Morris Brown College that make up that area. So it was very, very poor. I was very economically poor uh, growing up, but I was never spiritually poor. I like to make the distinction between being economically um, impoverished versus being spiritually impo impoverished. And why I say that is that though we were materially poor, um, my mother, who I like to say wore the spiritual pants in the family because my dad was always working. So my dad, I, I don't have many memories of my dad being around the house because he was always working. So my mom, when I say she wore the spiritual pants in the family, she was the one who always saw we were in church on Sunday mornings and Sunday nights and Wednesday nights. That was, um, that's just how we lived uh, growing up. So it was my mom who first exposed me to the idea that there was a God and that he had a son named Jesus. And, uh, you know, my mom, you know, her theology wasn't um, necessarily very refined, uh, you might say, but she taught us what she knew. She taught us what she understood. Um, so even from the youngest, my youngest remembrance, I've always had an idea that there was a God. Now, let me fast forward to the late 80s, where I was uh, a member of First Baptist, First Baptist Church of Atlanta, where Dr. Charles Stanley, the late Dr. Stanley, was the senior pastor. And um, listening to Dr. Stanley, Stanley was the first pastor that I ever heard preach from a translation of the Bible that was not New King James. I always struggled, and in most urban uh churches that have predominantly black congregations, you're going to be reading from the King James Version. I just couldn't get with all the these, thous, and, you know, all that. I just had a hard time reading the Bible uh, as a young child and then as a young adult. But when I got to First Baptist Atlanta and I heard Dr. Stanley read from a Ryrie New American Standard translation, so I was like, I understand what he's saying. I really understand what he's saying. So since then, since around 1986, 87, I've been uh, using a, a, a New American Standard translation um, Bible, not a Ryrie, but I use the John MacArthur Study Bible. But being able to understand the Bible and 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 uh, and read it for myself, you know, God used that to bring me to faith. As a matter of fact, it was my first visit to First Baptist Atlanta that, um, like most Southern Baptist churches, as you sign a card as a visitor, they'll probably send somebody from the church to come and pay a, pay a visit to you. So that's what happened to me. <clears throat> a husband and wife who happened to both play in the orchestra at First Baptist Atlanta came to visit me at my apartment, and they would walk me through the Romans Road, the 
salvation. Uh, now, whether you're pro-Romans Road or not, in terms of an evangelistic tool, uh, God used that to make me aware for the very first time that I was a sinner. I was a pretty moral guy. Uh, growing up, I lived a pretty boring life. You know, I didn't have a lot of friends. I didn't uh, engage in a lot of social activities. So I thought it was pretty good. I thought I was going to heaven at that point. I didn't have a record, not even as much as a speeding ticket. I thought I was good to go until, um, you know, I sat down with this couple in the uh, living room of my one bedroom apartment on, on uh, Camelton Road uh, on the south side of Atlanta. And I was made aware that I was a sinner. So this might have been around February of 1987, uh, where I came to know what it meant to believe in Christ and the work is life, death, burial and resurrection for the forgiveness of my sins. Uh, so I've been a Christian, born again, uh, understandably born again and understanding what that means since uh, since 1987. And I have to uh, thank my mother, my now late mother. My mother uh, died in April, April 24th of this year. So I buried her only a few months ago. But I have to thank my mom for, uh, you know, God being able to use her to bring me really to where I am right now in terms of ministry. So, yeah. That's fantastic. Praise God. But I would say the most dangerous, and when I say dangerous, I mean the most demonic, the most satanic, absolutely, is the transgenderism issue. Transgenderism is robbing young people of their Imago Dei identity, their identity in terms of Genesis 127, how God destined from before eternity, before the creation of the world, to design them as they entered this world. And that that ideology, that worldview is so blatantly destructive, not only of your God-given personality, your your God-given proclivities, your God-given uh, predetermined, providentially determined sex in terms of male or female. It's not only destroying that, it's destroying people's lives psych psychologically. More, trans more young people today are on uh, drugs. They're getting psycho psychological therapy um, because of the lies that the world is being told to them that they are, they've been born in the wrong body. That if they reference God at all, that God made a mistake. And you have the power. As a matter of fact, you're obligated to change who you are to align with how you, what you feel, what gender you feel you are. And um, as I studied the whole transgenderism issue, I found that if, when you go back to some of the more secular psychologists, all the way back to people like Freud, Nietzsche, and people like those who are really undergird, who really undergirded what we're seeing right now is a trans transgender movement. These are all individuals who were either atheists or agno agnostics. They had no idea of a uh, Genesis 127. Um, identity perspective that God created you in his image, male and female. And and we're seeing this 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 worldview, this ideology played out in the culture today to where you have young people, the suicide rate among transgender uh, young people right now is just absolutely horrific um, because they have, it's, it's just a sense of lostness. They have no hope. You want to talk about being hopeless? Transgender young people today are living with no hope whatsoever. Um, so my counsel to Christian young people who may be listening to this, if even you, let alone someone you may know, if you are in a, a particular state of confusion about who God not only made you to be, but who God providentially and sovereignly intended to make you uh, to make you to be. I want to encourage you to go back and read Genesis 1 and 2. Go back and read Genesis 1 and 2 and understand that God, before the foundation of the world, planned providentially to create you, to ordain that you be born into this world either as a male or a female. This was God's design for you. You are not a mistake. There is nothing about you that needs to be corrected. Get into the Word of God, read the first couple of chapters of Genesis, and understand who you are as an image bearer of God and use what you're being taught in Genesis to reject the lives of the world. Because again, this is a satanic, demonic lie that is designed to destroy you and to keep you from God's ordained uh, destiny for your life. Every single one of us, including the four of us who are doing this podcast right now, you, we're more than flesh and blood. We have souls, souls that are one day going to stand before God. Fundamentally, that is why it is important to engage transgender boys, transgender girls, transgender males, and transgender females, which is, I have to say this as we're discussing this. The whole idea of transgender male is contradictory. Transgender female is contradictory. Your gender is fixed. Your gender is fixed because your sex is fixed. 
So there's no such thing as transitioning. You don't transition. The best you can do is change your outward appearance. The best you can do is have some sort of radical surgical procedure. But until you, until humanity finds a way to change your chromosomes from one set to another, you are the sex that you are. I don't care whatever else you do to yourself. You're going to, your sex is fixed and it will, it is immutable. It is unchangeable. But what you have to understand is, uh, is that the roots of the transgender movement are satanic. And we know that scripture says that the enemy comes to kill, to steal and destroy. And that's exactly what the transgender movement wants to do. It wants to blind you to who God truly made you to be so that you destroy yourself. Again, this is why I alluded to earlier, the suicide rate among transgender young people is through the roof. And there's got to be a reason why. You know internally, excuse me, you know internally, God has given you an innate awareness, number one, of his existence, that's Romans 1. And then number two, if you read the book of Ecclesiastes, you understand that from the moment you were conceived, you're on a path to know God and to serve here, to serve him. You do not exist in this world for no reason. You have a purpose and a reason, a providential purpose and a reason for being here. So I encourage you to please get into the scriptures, ask God to help you understand who you are in him, who you are in Christ, that your identity is eternal, not just temporal in this world, who you are in him, who you are in the Lord Jesus Christ, and to help you reject the lies of the world, to show you what his will and plan is for your life, and to incur, empower you rather through his Holy Spirit to follow his will for the rest of your life. I love the way you phrased that. And so many young people are struggling with that today and that identity issue and, mm-hmm. and just reminding young people that God does not make mistakes. He right. made you on purpose for right. a purpose. And along that note, why do you think so many Christians nowadays are starting to buy into this demonic movement? I think a lot of them are trying to buy into it because I think they just want to belong to something. They want to belong to something. Listen, there are a lot of lonely people on this planet. COVID didn't help. I think COVID, if anything, it is... For a lot of people, it exasperated an already um, situation, an already present situation of loneliness, despair, depression, anxiety. So COVID sort of um, elevated that reality for a lot of people. And now that we're sort of in sort of a post uh, COVID period, I think a lot of people, including a lot of professing Christians, are having a hard time adjusting to reacclimating to society. So a siloed existence, a solo existence. A singular existence was their reality for almost three years. So how do I re-engage in society after three years of being by myself, having limited or no friends, maybe, having their churches closed, that, that cut off for many people a sort of lifeline that they, am, they may have had in terms of support, encouragement, discipleship. How do I re-engage with that? And I think the church has a huge responsibility there to expend whatever resources are necessary to identify who these people are, reach out to them with a loving, merciful, compassionate heart to encourage them to come back into the body. This is where you belong. This is where you belong. This is this, this is where we do the one another's. We do the one another's at the local church level. But on the flip side of that, and the flip side of the church having a responsibility, I think those people, those individuals have a responsibility as well to make known to their friends, to make known to their parents, to make known to their churches the issues that they're struggling with, to come forward with those. Um, no one's a mind reader. I, 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 I think, and I'm, I'm sad to have to say this, but I think within many local churches, there's, there's this pressure to present yourself as if there's nothing wrong with your life. There's nothing wrong. Everything's fine. I'm good. I love Jesus. We walk in, we sing the hymns, we go to the Sunday school classes, we go to the small group Bible studies, we sit through the sermons because we don't want anyone to know that there's something wrong. Well, the gospel is fundamentally for people who have something wrong. And the one thing the one thing wrong about us that we all have in common is our sin. As Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So there's, there's, a, there's a dualism here uh, with respect to the church being proactive in identifying those folks who need help, who need to be brought into fellowship. Then on the flip side of that, flip side of that is that those who need the help need to swallow their pride and reach out to churches. If there's a church they're connected to, a friend who may be connected to a church that can help encourage them to become 
re-engaged with that local body so that they can get the spiritual first, the spiritual help they need, and maybe beyond that, some of the practical help that they need also to, to heal from that. All I can say is this, is that scripture is sufficient. So as you have opportunities to disciple uh, young people who are in a situation where they're finding it difficult to re-engage um, uh, either from, a, from the standpoint of a local body of believers or to a larger society in general, bring them in and be from, be so from pastors, be so familiar with the scriptures yourself that you can walk them through what the scriptures uh, teach. Um, again, going back to Genesis and, and walking them all the way through the scriptures for as long as it may take. Because again, like I said earlier, these are souls that are at stake. You are, you are on a mission of discipleship and building them up for all eternity, not just for right now. Uh, so again, I would encourage pastors, um, senior pastors, the leadership teams to even make, even be sacrificial. If you have to sacrifice your time, then so be it. Um, you're a pastor. You, 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 you signed up for this. Mm -hmm. You signed up not just for the good times uh, as it relates to your local fellowship. You, you signed up for the uh, more challenging times as well. Um, and this is really what you signed up for. You, you are a shepherd of the sheep. Your job is to meet the spiritual needs of the sheep. Now, saying that, I'm thinking about John 15, 5, where Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing. So pastor, don't take this all on your, on your own shoulders. You must rely on the Holy Spirit to give you empowerment, to give you strength, to give you wisdom, to walk, excuse me, to walk along this approach that God, that God gives you in discipling these young people. Um, especially if you're a young pastor, you don't have much experience under your belt. It may be easy to get overwhelmed with the responsibility that God has laid at your feet. But again, your job is to trust him. This is God's church. You're God's pastor. So don't ever think that you, did, you need to Make yourself like the Greek god Atlas and just take the whole world on your shoulders because that's then you're going to end up in the same uh, mental, physiological, psychological state as the people you're trying to help. So rely on the Lord, rely on the Holy Spirit, entrench yourself in the Word of God, study it so that you can be uh, effective in discipling the people who, who come to you with their, their spiritual and temporal needs. Yeah, and something we say often is as pastors, don't be afraid to talk about these issues with your congregation. You got to make sure that they're aware and how to deal with these issues because if our congregations, if our peoples are not coming to us for those answers, they're going to find those answers somewhere else. They're going right. to find those answers from an anti-God secular culture. So let's make sure the, we're giving them those answers. And the, pro the reason I, I so agree with what you just said, the the problem we're facing right now is that so many young people have already gone to other places for those answers. Exactly. That's, what, that's yeah. why they're in the shape they're in. Yeah, so in our last couple of minutes here, um, for people who want to know more about you and maybe some of your resources, could you point them to maybe a, w a website, books, resources, anything like that? Yeah, so be glad to. Uh, so again, you can find out more about uh, myself uh, and, our, and, and the, minister, the Just Thinking ministry by going to two places. Number one, justthinking.me. That's justthinking.me. That's one word, justthinking.me. That will take you to our podcast library where you can just click on the podcast link. We've got the entire library of 100 episodes there. You can listen online for free. Or again, you can download the Just Thinking podcast. Just type in Just Thinking in your podcast app and you can be, you can download us there. Also, in terms of uh, other ministry opportunities on my blog site, which is at Deacon Darrell, that's the word Deacon, D-A-R-R-E-L-L.com, Deacon Darrell.com. There I keep my calendar. So just click the calendar link and then you can see where, where I'm going to be speaking. I may be speaking near your area and you can come out and support us there as well. So just thinking about me and then deacondarrell.com. Wow, that was an amazing conversation, JJ. That was a fantastic conversation. We hope you're very encouraged by it. Yep. And meanwhile, keep standing on the truth of God's word with zero compromise. See you guys later. God bless.